Tonight on News Center 5, a special Unit 5 report on drug smuggling. We'll have exclusive pictures of Spider-Man's return to face his latest Chicago challenge. And a Trailways bus driver strike affects a few people. But first, Chicago's hard drug trafficking has increased at an almost out-of-control rate. Heroin and cocaine are reaping unbelievable profits for suppliers. In a week-long series of reports, News Center 5's award-winning Unit 5 team traces the scope of Chicago's drug connections in a story we call High Crimes. Rich Samuels joins us now for part one of High Crimes with an overall look at who's getting rich off the drug users. Rich? Ron, last year the illicit drug business in this country generated as much as $90 billion. That means the illicit drug business ranks second only to the Exxon Corporation as a moneymaker. Exxon, of course, pays taxes and contributes to the gross national product. But the illicit drug business doesn't pay a penny of taxes, and to its victims, it contributes only misery and sometimes death. Now, what I have just said should come as no surprise. These words have been said so often that they may have lost their meaning. To restore meaning to these words, we're going to show you over the coming week things you have never seen before. Curiously, some of the most striking and shocking things you are going to see are, in fact, the most commonplace. Tonight, for example, we begin with a heroin addict. There's nothing unusual about that. There are perhaps 450,000 others in the country just like him. But you have probably never seen him or any other addict do what he's about to do. Bear in mind that this is something he most likely does every day, making others victims of his addiction just as he is one. 29-year-old James Shannon, known on the street as Crush, is a heroin addict, and he's about to steal to sustain his habit. He will break into this car. He will steal whatever value he can find. What he steals, he will sell. And with the money he gets, he will buy heroin. Not far away, a needle is jabbed into the neck of another addict, and heroin begins to pump into his central nervous system. This is a so-called shooting gallery. Its location, an apartment in a CHA housing project. Here, addicts have a place to quietly enjoy their drugs. Floyd, the man who runs this place, collects an appropriate service fee from his clients. He measures their dosage. He prepares the syringe. He administers the injection and his grateful clients drift off into euphoria. Crush has been drifting off into euphoria for at least 10 years and stealing to make that possible. In fact, over the past decade, Crush has been arrested 68 times. 44 times, the charges have been theft-related. But arrests and prosecutions have not deterred Crush, and always to buy heroin, Crush will steal and run. Nineteen-year-old Steve is an addict who stole and ran five years, and it was stopped only by an armed robbery conviction. I got 30 years facing me. There's a big chance I might go there. But I'm straight up. The judge offered Steve a choice. 30 years in the joint or a drug rehabilitation program. Steve chose the latter. I shot pieces, too. I mainlined it into my arm. I was mainly, you know, basically just my arm. And when I was first introduced to PCP, that's how I started doing it. You know, I didn't start, I didn't snort it, or I didn't need it. Steve's uh, drug was PCP, which made him feel bigger than life, yeah. which made him feel no pain, and which made him steal when his habit began to cost him $50 a day. Those who benefited from Steve's $50 a day habit in all likelihood were members of the Outlaws Motorcycle Gang. Federal authorities believe the outlaws control a significant share of the market in both PCPs and amphetamines. You'll meet the outlaws with Unit 5 this week. You'll also meet an alleged organized crime figure, a former Chicagoan now on the West Coast who investigators believe has moved on a very large scale what's become this country's most profitable illicit drug, cocaine. Profits. Profits upon which not a penny of taxes are paid are, of course, what draws people to the drug trade. These are the spoils of one such profitable operation. They belong to a family that only six years ago was living in Chicago on welfare. Tomorrow in Texas, members of that family will try to convince a jury that its suddenly acquired wealth came from legitimate businesses. You'll meet members of that family who investigators believe have made a fortune from heroin. and from B-grade movies in which they themselves appear and which investigators believe are financed with drug money. Your returns are double what you put into it. 
And Unit 5's undercover camera will introduce you to individuals who show how easily the profits of drugs are acquired. Individuals who, in fact, offer to set us up in the drug trade, promising to make us a fortune. Law enforcement officials in their war against the drug trade win some minor skirmishes and an occasional major battle. But their budgets are small change compared to the profits of their enemies, who continue to deal on the streets and who continue to collect their cash, from addicts like Crush who steal to buy their drugs and who are forgotten and for whom there is no hope, and for addicts like Steve, who found their way into a rehabilitation program and for whom there might be hope, but for whom there is no guarantee of salvation. We're dope fiends. We're scum of the earth. Nobody wants us. You want to be a dope fiend, a gangster all your life? You want to be in and out of joint all your life? What you're feeling right now, don't let go of it. <clears throat> don't let go of it. There ain't no more chances for people like you and me. The system don't want to deal with you. The only thing they got for you is to lock your ass up. And it's such a damn waste. Don't forget it now, huh? What is greater, the suffering of the victim or the profits of the drug trafficker? And who is winning the war against the illegal drug, drug trade? Just this past week, the Reagan administration told the Federal Drug Enforcement Administration to cut its 1982 budget by 12 percent. This at the same time the Reagan administration says it wants to step up the war against drugs. Does this mean the remaining resources will be used more effectively? Or does this mean that those who should be going to jail will instead be laughing all the way to the bank? Our reports over the coming week may suggest some answers to these questions. These reports will be coming from the front lines of this battle, and with our undercover camera, will take you behind the lines of the enemy as well. Right. Rich, I think I've been operating under the misconception that uh, drug trafficking was highly organized. You had to have some real good connections, but your unit's trip to uh, Texas showed them that if you got a few bucks uh, and you can meet one or two of the right people, it's relatively easy. That's something uh, that we that I think surprised me very much and surprised the rest of us. And on Wednesday night, uh, uh, we will see indeed just how easy it is. Uh, we, as a matter of experiment, wanted to find out what we could learn about getting ourselves involved in this. Uh, and uh, I, I think we were all quite surprised. And uh, the twists and uh, changes this story took are quite uh, bizarre and not over yet. What about the money that comes from drug trafficking? Uh, obviously, it does not all go to one central syndicate, uh, if you will. No, it goes to a number of different places. And in fact, the story we're going to bring tomorrow night about this family that only five years ago was living in Chicago on welfare and is today worth millions. Uh, you'll get some idea is probably as to where that money went. Uh, there, in fact, is a trial beginning in Texas tomorrow to determine whether, in fact, the government may have illegally seized a, a great deal of their personal and real assets as the result of their possible involvement in the drug trade. On Tuesday night, uh, or rather, yeah, Tuesday night, we're going to look and see uh, the role that organized crime may be playing in the cocaine trade, where there's a tremendous amount of money to be generated. And then again on Wednesday, we're going to look at uh, uh, our own excursions into seeing how difficult it might be to make us drug entrepreneurs. Or how easy it might be. How easy, easy it might it be. actually ended up. All right, thanks very much, okay. Rich. Friday, seven-month Unit 5 investigation explores a Chicago heroin connection. It's a connection that allegedly took a Chicago family from rags to riches. And New Center 5's Rich Samuels joins us now with that story. Rich? Linda, imagine a family living in Chicago in 1978, running a, fall, a small food store and somehow or other collecting welfare. Now imagine that same family in 1981, living in Texas, with swimming pools, Mexican villas, expensive cars, jewels, racehorses, and spending a seemingly boundless wealth like there was no tomorrow. Well, that's the family you're about to meet. They're the Montemayors. What explains their sudden rise from poverty? Hard work, they say. Heroin, the government says. And today, in a Brownsville, Texas courtroom, the government and the Montemayors locked horns in a battle that could turn out to be a legal milestone. 37-year-old Matias Montemayor, according to federal authorities, is a heroin entrepreneur whose drug dealings have made him a millionaire. 39-year-old Benito Montemayor, his brother, is also a heroin entrepreneur, authorities claim, and is also worth millions. 
In fact, the entire Montemayor family is believed to be involved in the drug trade, from which it's amassed a small fortune. The Montemayor family and its friends are believed to be among the overlords of the heroin market in Chicago. According to a Federal Narcotics Task Force report, their operation includes the full spectrum of illicit narcotics trafficking, from source to market. The Montemayors, that report states, control poppy fields in Mexico, laboratories near Monterey, stashed locations near the border, and a distribution network stretching from South Texas to Chicago. Matias Montemayor is believed to run that operation and head the family. Matias is presently jailed on federal weapons charges. Brother Benito is believed to head the family's distribution network. Benito was named in federal drug conspiracy charges 12 days ago and is presently a fugitive. Brother Manuel is said to be a partner in the organization and is now in federal custody, as is Brother Maynardo. Brother Reyes, known to Chicago authorities since the mid-1960s, has long been a fugitive on drug charges and remains in Mexico. Before 1978, the Montemayors lived in the Chicago area, but while they were here, there was no particular evidence that they had a great deal of money. They operated a food store, they lived in houses that were nice but nothing special. It was only after they left Chicago that the evidence of their wealth became very, very apparent. This, for example, was Matias Montemayor's home in Stone Park in 1978. Today, Matias owns this home in McAllen, Texas, a very large home with a pool. This home in Monterrey, Mexico, this ranch in Saralvo, Mexico, and this second ranch nearby with an M-shaped hacienda, M as in Montemayor. This is where Brother Benito lived in Stone Park in 1978. Today, he owns a home in McAllen, another home in Monterrey, and his own Saralvo ranch not far from his brother's. Brother Reyes owns a palatial home overlooking Monterey. It's a home narcotics agents have never been able to find. The Montemayors have also invested in racehorses and in cars and trucks and other assorted rolling stock, but above all in jewelry, the value of which is measured in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. The wealth of this family could only have come from drug profits, investigators believe, but others disagree. They're a bunch of uh, uh, very uh, decent, hard-working uh, gentlemen. And the, uh, the uh, wives and children are just uh, fine people. Montemayor attorney Michael Guinan claims the Montemayors are legitimate businessmen. Monterey, Mexico, he says, is the source of their wealth, specifically the Montessa Corporation, the family's heavy construction business. Montessa builds roads and dams, and Montessa has diversified most recently into films. Pistoleros famosos. Pistoleros famosos is Montessa's first film. Reyes Montemayor produced it. This film paints the family bigger than life because the Montemayors themselves appear in it. Reyes Montemayor, in real life, a fugitive from American justice. Es el cuento de nunca acabar. In Pistoleros Famosos, he's a Mexican federal agent on the trail of smugglers. His wife is an elegantly dressed extra. His son, a street urchin. Manuel Montemayor, recently in real life, thrown into the slammer. Anta Colucio Peña. Creo que viven juntos. In Pistoleros Famosos, he's on the loose and relating poorly to women. The Montemayor racehorses appear in the film. So does the Montemayor rolling stock. And at the home of Brother Reyes, the fugitive, the home narcotics agents haven't been able to find, the welcome mat is rolled out. This film has substantially increased the Montemayor's assets. But in another area, those assets have been substantially reduced. Last April 28th, long before the recent criminal charges were filed, federal agents entered the Montemayor homes in McAllen, Texas, and began to confiscate everything they could find. They confiscated cash. They confiscated the rolling stock. They confiscated the jewels. They confiscated the horses. And they confiscated the houses, and they kicked the Montemayors out. I hope. Nobody else in this country has to ever go through what me and my children went through that day. My little boy asked me when he come home from school, Benny, he's 11, 
to ask, he said, what's going on here, Mom? And I said, I'll tell you later. One of the agents is walking through from my kitchen into the TV room, and he says to my son, your dad's selling drugs. And my little boy says, you're a liar. And he started crying. My husband does not sell drugs. He works for Montessa. That all, all of our money comes from there. All this was taken because a judge was convinced there was probable cause that all this was acquired with the proceeds of the Montemayor's Chicago-bound drug trade. Civil confiscations like this have been authorized in the past, but never before in the absence of any criminal charges. That's the unfortunate part of the statute, is the drug agents are able to act at their own whim, uh, unchecked, so to speak. It's a sort of action that will result in a police state if it's allowed to go on. In the past, the drug law enforcement concept was to take away their drugs and take away their freedom by ha convicting them and placing them in jail. If we can also plug in taking away their assets, the profit, the capital that they make out of it, uh, they suffer to lose more. It could be a more viable deterrent. It could take away the urge for people to get into the narcotics traffic. If this law is to go on any time, day or night, you don't, it's, it's not your home anymore. They might as well say, well, it's the government's. Though portions of the Montemayor wealth are now in the government's hands, the family's heroin operation appears to be intact. Only last August 18th, Chicago police seized 18 bags of the purest Mexican heroin they'd seen in five years. Those arrested belong to a family with direct ties to the Montemayor organization. One has already fled to Monterrey. So, in spite of some losses, the Montemayors are probably still in business. Well, it's the government's job now to show that the family's business is indeed drugs and that drug money accounts for its rather spectacular wealth. If the government fails to prove that point, the Montemayors get everything back. Now, if there is big money in heroin, there's even bigger money in cocaine. The crime syndicate knows that. And tomorrow night at 10 o'clock, we'll introduce you to a former Chicagoan who investigators believe has a corner on the cocaine market for the mob. Chuck you know, Rich, for some people, movie making is a rather risky proposition, but can you tell us what happened to this particular film? It was not risky for the Montemayors. They said they invested $350,000 in that film. Within three weeks after release, they had recouped their investment and uh, probably have made at least a million dollars so far. It looked like an amazing film. People are flocking to see it. Thank you, Rich. Thank you, Rich. From our Unit 5 investigative team tonight, there is documented evidence of the mob's latest big money maker. We're going to see how organized crime is involved in Chicago's cocaine trade. Rich Samuels joins us now to tell us who is involved. Linda, cocaine is now the biggest money maker for those who deal in illicit drugs, and organized crime has recently acquired a big corner in the cocaine market. Among the reputed mobsters believed to control the cocaine market is a former Chicagoan, whose dealings have attracted the attention of, an attention of investigators from coast to coast. Usually, we introduce the subjects of our reports, but tonight, Sam Sarsinelli himself does the honors. Can I help you? Sam Sarsinelli, according to his attorney, is a complex man with many facets. Hi, my name's Rich. Hi, Sam Sarsinelli. Sam Sarsinelli is an outgoing, freewheeling high roller who's traveled extensively in a leased Learjet, a Learjet investigators believe has been used to transport cocaine who's kept company with individuals believed to deal in cocaine on a large scale, and who's dealt in high-priced California real estate through an operation investigators believe was used in part to launder drug money. Sam Sarsinelli, according to Chicago Police Intelligence, is a crook. A crook, they say, is the man in charge of narcotics for the Chicago mob. The interesting thing about Sam Sarsinelli, however, is that you're not likely to find him in Chicago. That's because for the last five years or so, he's been living here in Southern California. Most recently, in a house overlooking the Woodland Hills area of Los Angeles. And at his Woodland Hills office, Sarsinelli has surrounded himself with an ever-changing cast of characters. Some, like their boss, have migrated west from Chicago to California. But all are the subjects of continuing federal investigations by federal and local authorities. Investigations centering on the traffic in cocaine. Sam Sarsinelli has described himself as a self-employed stock and real estate broker whose business causes him to travel throughout the country, in his words, 
living out of a suitcase. At a Fort Lauderdale motel, one of his suitcases was opened by federal narcotics agents and found to contain $55,000 in cash. Sarsinelli's motel suite also yielded 13 pounds of cocaine, which he was allegedly offering to sell for $275,000. That was in June 1979. Curiously, as of December of last year, Sarsinelli had filed no personal tax return for 1979, or for 1978, or 1977, or 1976, or 1975. When Sarsinelli said his business caused him to travel throughout the country, he wasn't exaggerating. Between the spring of 1980 and the spring of 1981, he logged at least 100,000 miles, all in his leased corporate jet. The travels of this Learjet were closely monitored by law enforcement agencies from coast to coast. Though the Van Nuys, California airport was the plane's home base, the aircraft was seldom here. Sarsinelli was more likely on his way to South Florida, to New York City, or to Chicago. At Midway Airport, Sarsinelli's jet was spotted at least a dozen times during the first three months of this year alone. The men in the cockpit believed Sarsinelli was transporting precious gems. But law enforcement officials believe this aircraft carried an even more precious commodity, cocaine. On one occasion, as much as 187 pounds of the drug, worth nearly $4.6 million at the price Sarsinelli is said to have been asking. Joining Sarsinelli on his transcontinental flights were others with strong links to the cocaine trade. Chicagoan Lawrence Brady was one of Sarsinelli's fellow passengers. Brady's believed to have been one of Sarsinelli's cocaine distributors. In happier times, Lawrence Brady was a Chicago police officer. But on Valentine's Day 1980, Officer Brady was busted by other officers in DuPage County, who found in his possession 30 grams of cocaine. Officer Brady resigned from the Chicago Police Department. And 13 months later, he was spotted in Sarsinelli's jet in Chicago, Denver, and Los Angeles. And on April 1st of this year, Brady was again busted, this time on Hoffman Estates with more than seven pounds of cocaine. Frank Salcido, better known as Crazy Frank, was another passenger on Sarsinelli's jet. Salcido was believed to be a source of cocaine supply. A large dog guards the entrance to Crazy Frank's motorcycle shop in Sun Valley, California, where Crazy Frank's employees do not welcome the inquiries of outsiders. Crazy Frank has pleaded guilty to federal charges of cocaine possession. Crazy Frank took at least 10 trips on Sarsinelli's jet. In the neighborhood of $100,000 worth of fuel was purchased by Sarsinelli to keep his jet flying. He paid for all that fuel in cash. When asked why, he replied he preferred the simplicity of cash. In Laguna Beach, California, Sarsinelli poured additional cash into a real estate operation investigators believed was financed in part with drug money. Located in an office complex not far from the Pacific shore, Sarsinelli's Laguna Real Estate and Construction Company had some intriguing backers. The late reputed Chicago mobster Samuel Anarino was one of Sarsinelli's partners in Laguna. But a silent partner after June 1977, when Anarino was gunned down in a still unsolved mob hit, presumably stemming from Anarino's involvement in stolen cars and cocaine. Walter Micus, presently of Hillside, was Laguna Real Estate's president. Micus is Sarsinelli's brother-in-law and was nabbed last year by the FBI in a raid on a Bolita operation in the western suburbs. The Justice Department believes that illegal gambling operation to have been under the direct control of organized crime. Pamela Messina, Sarsinelli's girlfriend, was Laguna's corporate secretary. Messina, like Sarsinelli, is under indictment in Florida for an alleged cocaine conspiracy. The high-priced real estate that Sarsinelli and Laguna purchased and the homes and buildings Laguna built on it amassed the company at one point assets of more than $2 million. But Sarsinelli's operation also benefited from the cash contributions of outside investors. And on Laguna Real Estate's partnership documents, the one name that stands out more than any other is that of Howard Carroll. Howard Carroll is an Illinois state senator. He's represented the 15th district for the past 10 years. And on May 19, 1977, Senator Carroll signed up to become a partner in Laguna Real Estate's most ambitious undertaking, the $1.2 million office complex in Laguna Beach known as The Colony. Senator Carroll says he made the investment on the recommendation of a law partner who had heard of the opportunity from a client. The client was a North Shore doctor with previous business ties to Sarsinelli. 
Sam Sarsinelli's involvement in the colony and Laguna was unknown to the senator. Had you known that Mr. Sarsinelli was, in fact, the principal behind Laguna, how would that have affected your decision to invest or not invest? Not only would we have not invested in it, I think we would have uh, strongly recommended to our client also not to invest in it. And uh, if there was any reason for that client or in any other case where they would, for other reasons, still want to invest with those type of people, we wouldn't want to represent them. Sarsinelli's Laguna Beach real estate business went on the rocks in 1979. Sarsinelli remains in business, but the precise nature of it remains a mystery, despite his apparent wish to satisfy the curious. Call my office, come in any time you want. My attorney will be there and I'll answer any questions you want. Any questions you might want, there are many questions you might have. How about okay? can you answer any of them right now? Why should I stand out here and answer them? Just come on into the office, make an appointment, and I'll talk to you. Anything you want to talk about. I'd be happy to. You don't have to stand out here and take pictures. That was the afternoon of September 30th. The evening of September 30th, Sarsinelli's attorney said his client would have nothing more to say, but that he would provide a written statement. The statement, the attorney said, would come within four days. But to this date, Sam Sarsinelli has not responded. And his attorney, David Gornell of Sherman Oaks, California, has not responded to our phone calls over the past month. In another area, though, we've had no lack of response from hundreds of would-be conspirators who want to set us up in the drug business. They wanted to fly cocaine for us. They said they were willing to kill to make sure the load got delivered. They told us they could make us millions. You'll meet them tomorrow at 10 o'clock when Unit 5 goes undercover. In an exclusive report tonight, Unit 5 shows just how easy it is to set up an international drug business. Apparently there are plenty of people who are willing to show you just how to do that. Tonight, Rich Samuels is going to introduce us to some of those people. Linda, last year the illicit drug business generated between 70 and 90 billion dollars. And it apparently takes no great sophistication to grab a share of those big bucks. That's what we discovered when we decided to find out how hard it would be for rank amateurs like us to set ourselves up in the drug business. All we needed was a little help, and that help was very easy to find. Money. I want you to I need, I need the goddamn money. I'm, I'm, I'm poor. Get rich quick. I'd like to run two or three for you. Frank McDonald is a pilot. Frank McDonald wants to fly narcotics for us. Say if you want to fly a plane load of marijuana back to state. If somebody had to be killed to get here, that plane would get here somewhere in that. Curtis Terry leads a band of armed mercenaries. Curtis Terry wants to protect our dope smuggling operation. I've, I've got a plan here now that I believe will work with no threat to me. Sean Bird has devised a foolproof cocaine smuggling scheme. Sean Bird wants us to finance it. Recruiting this trio to provide a plane for, to fly, and to protect what would clearly have been an illegal drug operation was surprisingly easy. In fact, nearly 400 individuals wrote us saying they wanted to be part of our scheme. They responded to our ad in an aircraft magazine in which we promised both high risk and high pay. Among the eager respondents were those who said they were law enforcement officers, a boy scout master, a little league coach, and an elder of the Presbyterian Church. But these are the three who eventually recited their qualifications to our undercover camera. And to a man they knew as Tony, ostensibly an unprincipled businessman in search of a pilot to run drugs, who in reality was Unit 5's executive producer. To a woman they knew as Joellen Scally, presumably Girl Friday, to an equally unprincipled Chicago investor who wanted to buy a plane to smuggle narcotics. Joellen, who in reality was a Unit 5 producer. And to Rudy Sundwall, her boss a man with lots of cash to invest in the drug trade, when reality was a Unit 5 reporter. What characterized the would-be conspirators with whom we dealt was a common desire to make money. Craig Terry, the mercenary. Me, myself, I have, you know, if somebody's paid me enough money, I don't give a damn who it is, except the president of the United States. Craig Terry says he draws the line only at killing high public officials. In the past, he's operated within the law as a cop, serving on the police force of three small towns, all in West Texas. He presently advertises his services in Soldier of Fortune, a mercenary's journal. This is me. This is number two man. He provides prospective clients with dossiers detailing the accomplishments of his accomplices, including one called the Preacher, whom Terry says reads his victims the last rites of the church before killing them. 
The remaining pair of our team are presently functioning on the fringes of the law. Frank McDonald, the pilot. Working on the border. Uh, <clears throat> smuggling uh, mostly television sets and that sort of thing into Mexico. It's 100% legal. As long as McDonald keeps his television sets and stereos north of the border, it is 100% legal. But in Mexico, where import duties drive the cost of consumer electronics gear up 100%, his smuggling is very much against the law. But in the contraband Mexican flea markets, the demand for his bargain rate merchandise is high enough to justify the risks. McDonald begins his smuggling flights at the airport in Laredo, Texas, just north of one of the principal border crossings. He's used this DC-3, but in a smaller plane, he's flown two loads of marijuana from the Caribbean. I guess I'm naive. I guess I'm dumb. I didn't ask for anything up front. And because McDonald didn't ask for anything up front, the man he was flying for burned him royally. I'm a little upset. He, he didn't pay you for a uh, Not, not for... at all. I got... Uh, uh, for, for the work I did, and I, I delivered both loads nicely, exactly what the hell I was told to do in the long time. Where, where were you delivering? Great. Pot? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> what, what, he, uh, what he told me was to, to just a verbal agreement, you can't put these things in writing with I was supposed to get 40 bucks a pound. And uh, I delivered 800 pounds each of the two trips. Okay. Uh, should have been uh, sixty-four thousand dollars. Yeah. What I got was twelve. Twelve thousand yeah. dollars. So you got, you lost fifty-two thousand yeah. dollars. Yeah. Well, that, that gets me upset. The final member of our trio had a bit better luck running marijuana. Sean Berg, the young man with a cocaine scheme. We used to do about ten tons every ten days. Take four or five days off, and then do another ten tons every ten days. God. That was, you know, I had a great time doing it. He must it have made fun. a fortune. I made $80,000 in about six months. And then Sean Bird, as you probably can yeah. tell, deals in aircraft. Specifically, in McAllen, Texas, he sells old airplanes. And without any prompting, he surmised that the woman he believed to be Joellen Scally and her boss, Rudy, wanted a plane for dope smuggling. Given that, he was happy to give advice. Is, is this going to be for a hay hauling trip? I mean, that's basically what it's going to be for, right? Well, is it going to be coke or is it going to be pot? Because if it's going to be pot, then you need an aircraft that can take bulk. Sean Bird has been in this business long enough to know that among those who smuggle narcotics, there is a brisk market in otherwise unmarketable old planes. After a while, you know what people are looking for. You sell enough of these old junk heaps and, you know, there's one kind of people that, you know, they're willing to pay anything for the airplane and they just want to make sure it's going to run for one trip. Well, there's no legitimate operators looking for an airplane to do that. Sean was convinced that Joe Ellen and Rudy were not legitimate operators. He was also convinced that they lacked the experience to bring off a successful drug deal. What they needed was a surefire plan. Sean had such a plan, a plan to smuggle cocaine. He'd been working on it for years. All he needed was someone with a capital to bring it off. And on October 4th, he came to a motel room in northwest Indiana to meet Joe Ellen's boss, Rudy, a man he believed to have money to burn and capital that might get his cocaine deal off the ground. In terms of uh, in terms of capital, what uh, okay? What do you need to get this thing going? The first the first step, I want to do a small test run first, which would involve twenty kilos, and that's four hundred mm -hmm. four hundred twenty seven thousand dollars. Of that, two hundred thousand dollars actually going to buy the product, mm -hmm. and the other part is it's a two airplane operation. Mm -hmm. One of the people, I have to supply him with some guns, and that's, you know, for down in South America, which is no problem. You can, you, you, the, the guns, you can take care of. Well, yeah, that, that is their guarantee, you know, for letting me go up to the factory and get it. I mm -hmm. give them that, and we're friends. Mm -hmm. The economics of what Sean calls his test run are quite simple. With $200,000, he buys 20 kilos of cocaine direct from a clandestine laboratory in Colombia. With another $177,000, he buys two used aircraft to fly the load north. He invests a final $50,000 in guns and bribes. This adds up to $427,000, and that's the operating capital Sean wants from us. The gross return in 70 days, $1,040,000, and a substantial net for us to pocket. Like I say, on this first trip at this stage of the deal, your returns are double what you put into it. 
little bit better than double what you put into it. You're paying better than commercial paper does these days. Double my money in uh, 70. 70 days. Well, it's a little hard to, uh, you know, you can't put that out of your mind, can you? Sean Bird's drug flight would approach the South Texas coast in the manner of a plane returning from a Mexican electronic smuggling run. And up the Gulf Coast from Corpus Christi at the Aransas National Wildlife Refuge, Bird would parachute from that plane along with his 20 kilos of cocaine. Sean could probably have not picked a better location for this final phase of his operation. The Aransas Refuge is near the water. It's secluded. In fact, it's practically in the middle of nowhere. The Aransas Refuge is a bird watcher's paradise. But those who come here are on the lookout for rare migratory birds. They couldn't care less about Sean Bird, who, along with his cocaine, would float down to earth, presumably undetected, and easily make his way to safety and big profits provided he had our $427,000, for which time was of the essence. Are we saying that within 48 hours, 72 hours, we'll, we'll know if this is a go or not a go? Within 48 to 72 hours, you will know whether this is a go or not a go, and you'll hear through her. Okay. You're probably, you're never going to see me again. Not that I'm not a genial person, but I think it's, <laughs> I think it's best that way. Yeah. I was going to say, it won't bother me. <laughs> This deal, of course, did not go through. Now, Tony, my, my big concern is that you're not, uh, that you're not a, 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 right. a federal agent. Right. That's, that's the only goddamn thing in the world I'm concerned about. That ain't getting my money. <laughs> and we didn't hire Frank McDonald, the eager pilot. If, say, if you want a plane load of cocaine flown in, fine, I'll get it here. And, you know, that damn sure it gets delivered for you or whatever. Nor did we hire Curtis Terry, the mercenary, who said he'd kill if need be to get our drugs delivered. We didn't hire him, but the 778 citizens of Bells, Texas, did. They hired him to be their new chief of police. Chief Terry went on the job yesterday, and last night was confirmed in his post by the Bells City Council. And thereby hangs an interesting tale. What does a small Texas town do when it learns its new police chief is a would-be conspirator in a drug smuggling scheme? We'll have more on that at 4.30 tomorrow. And at 10 tomorrow night, we'll introduce you to 1,200 motorcycle gang members who for years have been making big money from drugs. Chuck and Linda? Rich, can you give That's us a amazing. hint? Because I'm sure a lot of people are saying, um, how is that town going to find out about this man? You the citizens of Bells, Texas are discovering this even as we are speaking right now because KXAS, the Fort Worth affiliate, is running a version of this story. I spoke earlier today to a city council member and explained him what we had, what uh, Chief Terry said. And he said, you have all that on tape? And I said, yes. And he said, well, I'll be sure to watch tonight. So he's watching now, I presume. Okay. Rich, now this scenario, this is typical of drug smuggling operations as, as far you've been able to... Uh... Well, this, I don't know how typical it is. This is what we found. Is that easy to be set up? I would set up presume a... that if, if we can do it, anybody can. All right, right. 4.30 and 10 tomorrow. Right. Thank you very much, Rich. A West Texas town is looking for a new police chief today, and that comes as a direct result of last night's Unit 5 investigative report entitled High Crimes. Our Unit 5 went undercover in Texas to see how easy it would be to set up a drug scam. Rich Samuels joins us with more on this now. Rich. Linda Curtis Terry resigned last night as the police chief of Bells, Texas. Well, this is news in Chicago only because Curtis Terry had earlier told Unit 5 he was willing to be a conspirator in what was presented to him as a drug smuggling scheme. Curtis Terry's tenure as police chief of Bells, Texas, ended after only 22 hours. There are two reasons why this town of 778 is now looking for a replacement. The first reason is an ad Terry placed in the magazine Soldier of Fortune several months ago, offering his services as a mercenary. The second reason is undercover tape documenting a meeting between Terry and Unit 5's executive producer Doug Longini. Unit 5 had answered Terry's Soldier of Fortune ad. Terry believed Longini to be a drug smuggler who needed protection for marijuana and cocaine smuggling runs. During the course of this conversation, Terry indicated he would have no qualms about guarding a plane load of illicit drugs. He also indicated he would kill if need be to make sure the drugs got delivered. Terry denied he had made these statements when questioned by a reporter from KXAS Fort Worth. Have you ever offered to run protection for any type of narc illegal narcotic smuggling at all or anything like that? No. You've never done that? No. Okay. So if you want a plane load of cocaine flown in, fine, I'll get it here. And, you know, like damn sure it gets delivered for you or whatever. Have you ever offered to 
kill anybody to protect any type of illegal narcotic smuggling at all. No. Certainly not. Say if you want to fly a plane load of marijuana back to the States, if somebody had to be killed to get it here, that plane would get here somewhere in that Terry also told Longini his team of mercenaries would perform contract murders for $20,000 and that one of his ambitions was to work for the mafia. I don't have anything to hide. I had not anything illegal. I don't have anything to hide. Curtis Terry resigned after he and James Rudd, the mayor of Bells, Texas, watched portions of Terry's undercover conversations broadcast on our Fort Worth affiliate last night. Mayor Rudd said today that after the broadcast ended, he told Terry he would have to resign because he would never have the respect of the people. The mayor told Terry, I'm going to wish you luck, I'm going to pray for you, but this should teach you a lesson to keep your mouth shut. Chuck and Linda. Now, did he ever admit to the conversation, even uh, after seeing it? Not in the, not in the course of uh, that conversation, and I wasn't there in the cafe in Bells, Texas, last night when this <laughs> ran, so I couldn't tell you precisely what happened. What happens to Terry now, do you suppose? Uh, Mr. Terry goes and tries to find another job. Okay, thank you very much. Another report tonight at 10. Right. Tonight, we take you inside a secret drug peddling organization. It is an organization with some unusual qualifications for membership, and Rich Samuels has more on that. Linda, imagine a club where the main requirement for membership is that you've committed a felony. Imagine a club where the members sell shares of their girlfriends as though they were a stock offering. Imagine a club where the members are conspirators in an international drug ring. But well, what sort of folks are these? They're rolling at you right now. These are members of the Outlaws Motorcycle Gang. The Outlaws are one of the nation's largest motorcycle gangs and one of the most violent. And the Outlaws are believed to make large profits from drugs. The Outlaws presently number about 1,200. Their appearance sets them off from the rest of society for which they seem to have nothing but contempt. But their looks can be deceiving, for within their own organization, they have a rigid structure which some observers liken to the iron-fisted discipline of the mafia. Pennsylvania Congressman Robert Walker, an expert on motorcycle gangs. They fit every description of organized crime. And uh, so that we are dealing not with a bunch of local hooligans uh, who uh, run around and break up a bar every once in a while. We're, we're talking about people who are sophisticated criminals who are engaged in every classification of crime in this, uh, in this country. The outlaws have a national president, William Stairway Harry Henderson. They have a national vice president, Joseph Taco Tyree. Courtney Grease Lightning Peters is their Chicago leader. And on Thursday nights, he can usually be found near the Outlaws Clubhouse on West Roosevelt Road. The Outlaws were, in fact, founded in Chicago in the early 1960s. And the Chicago Outlaws remain the focal point of the gang's 38 chapters in 12 states and 7 chapters in Canada. The Outlaws' illegal activities include prostitution, shakedowns, the sale of weapons, but above all, the traffic in the so-called synthetic drugs. It's the most important money maker in their activities, particularly methamphetamine has been uh, their major source of, uh, of income. And uh, uh, nationwide, it's estimated that they control uh, about 50% uh, of the manufacture of uh, methamphetamine and even a greater percentage of the distribution. The Federal Drug Enforcement Administration echoes the congressman's assessment. In a recent report, it terms the outlaws a major supplier of synthetic drugs in the eastern half of the U.S. and Canada. And from its Milwaukee headquarters, the DEA says the outlaws control methamphetamine sales throughout the entire state of Wisconsin. The outlaws' drug network stretches from Canada to South Florida, with tentacles stretching wherever the gang has chapters. They manufacture the drug in clandestine Canadian laboratories and move it across the border in exchange for weapons. Outlaw Gary Legault of St. Catharines, Ontario, is believed to be one of the Canadians involved in the drug's manufacture. His criminal record includes arrests for operating illegal speed laboratories. The outlaws have a new chapter in Buffalo, New York, near the Canadian border. Investigators believe this chapter was activated specifically because of its proximity to the Canadian source of supply. Outlaw William King O'Reilly of Windsor, Ontario, is believed to be another of the gang's Canadian connections. He allegedly moves the drug across the river to Detroit. And here, the medium of barter is the same. Drugs from Canada in exchange for guns from the United States. 
South Florida, presently the nation's drug capital, is another area where the outlaws are presently dealing drugs on a large scale. Outlaw David Surfer Bowlby is cited by both federal and local authorities as one of the gang's prime movers here. Formerly a member of the Chicago chapter and formerly national president of the outlaws, Bowlby now lives in Key West. Bowlby, according to Florida police intelligence reports, is a major narcotic supplier in the Florida Keys. From a Key West marina, he's believed to use large boats to smuggle marijuana on a multi-ton basis. And through the Island City Flight Service, of which he was a former part owner, he's believed to have used aircraft for drug smuggling operations. Outlaw Richard Dirty Dick Brainerd is another South Florida outlaw implicated in the drug trade. Brainerd is a charter boat captain whose fishing boat has been seized in the past loaded to the gills with marijuana. The outlaws have recently established a link between their Florida connection and the Southwest. Outlaw James Big Jim Nolan, formerly of Florida, now lives in Tucson. Court-authorized wiretaps of his Tucson telephone this summer reveal a consistent pattern of drug ordering from outlaw Samuel Sad Sammy Nail of Fort Lauderdale. Nolan indicated he wanted to set up a cocaine distribution network similar to one he had previously operated in Florida. Other conversations revealed outlaw Todd Kaufman of Oklahoma City was sending him regular shipments of methamphetamine. Violence is one of the common threads that binds the outlaws together. Members of the gang have been implicated in 77 homicides over the past 15 years. Their violence now seems directed towards members of rival motorcycle gangs and what investigators believe is a war to control drug markets. Over the past three years, this war has taken 12 lives. In this house in Charlotte, North Carolina in 1979, two outlaws and three associates were gunned down by members of the Hells Angels motorcycle gang. At the end of September of this year, Hells Angels gathered in Charlotte to pay their last respects to two members of their gang who had fallen, Tyler Yank Findak and Michael Thunder Finazzo, both shot through the forehead by outlaws who had forced them to kneel before the coup de grace was fired. The latest outburst of violence took the life of this Chicago outlaw, John Burrito Climbs, blown to bits in his truck October 8th. A week before the incident, Climbs told friends he was in some sort of trouble but there is still no clear motive for his murder. And there is still no clear course to follow in bringing groups like the outlaws to justice. No single law enforcement agency seems to be able to do the job. There needs to be a real uh, effort at the national level to, to put together strike forces that coordinate our activities. There is virtually no state of the union that does not have an outlaw motorcycle gang uh, that is uh, operating within it and operating in uh, several classifications of crime. Coordination of the federal agency's war against the illegal activities of bikers may not be likely in the short run, given budget cuts proposed for both the FBI and the Drug Enforcement Administration in the 1982 budget. And that raises the likelihood that these groups, presently almost impossible to infiltrate, will continue to thrive. Wiretaps and surveillance remain the most effective weapons for law enforcement officials in the war against bikers. Meanwhile, the city of Bells, Texas tonight is looking for a new law enforcement official. Police Chief Curtis Terry resigned last night after he and the mayor watched Unit 5's undercover report in which the police chief offered to kill in order to protect a drug smuggling flight. In accepting the resignation, the mayor of Bells, Texas said he wished the former police chief well and hoped this would teach him a lesson to keep his mouth shut.